Hi, and welcome to K-Pod, the podcast about Korean Americans in arts and culture from Korean American Story. I'm Juliana Sohn, a photographer. And I'm Catherine Hong, a writer and editor. Today, we're excited to share our interview with actor John Cho, who's just written his first book titled Troublemaker. It's a middle grade novel that follows the events of the L.A. riots through the eyes of Jordan, a 12-year-old Korean-American boy whose parents own a liquor store in Koreatown. Cho says he was inspired to write it after the killing of George Floyd and the ensuing protests, which reminded him of the turmoil of Sa Igu. In recent years, we've seen a boom of Asian-American actors in film and television. But for decades, John Cho was practically the only one. He first came to fame in 1999 with a small but memorable role in the movie American Pie. His big breakthrough was in 2004 playing Harold in the Harold and Kumar films, a role that challenged a lot of people's ideas about what a leading man could look like. John Cho has come to be known as the Asian guy who seems not so Asian, by building his career thoughtfully around taking roles that don't play into negative stereotypes. Cho was born in Seoul and moved to the States in 1978 when he was six. He studied English at UC Berkeley, which is where he began acting with the East West Players, an Asian American theater group. Today, Cho lives in Los Angeles with his wife and two children, a 13-year-old son and a nine-year-old daughter. We should explain to listeners that our conversation with John is actually in two parts because our first interview was cut short. We had so many questions we wanted to ask him, so we were so grateful that we were able to continue our conversation. Anyway, here's our interview with John Cho. He kicks it off by reading a passage from his book, Troublemaker. Truth was, I was having a hard time in school since sixth grade started. It wasn't always hard. For a long time, it was even kind of fun, the place where I got to see my friends and get out of the house. But lately I was struggling and home was feeling smaller than usual. Anytime Amma and Appa weren't working, they were there fighting, stressing, talking in low voices about how they couldn't let this business fail. They just couldn't. Sometimes the low voices got loud, but whenever I would poke my head in, Amma would wave me away. She said, don't worry, always don't worry. After that was a history test, a big red D at the top of the paper. I crumpled it, dropped it in my backpack. The tests kept piling up like snowballs in my bag. And the thing was, I couldn't explain it even if I wanted to. I didn't know how to explain that school was hard for me, that ever since Sarah got busier with volleyball, and all her other clubs, I would come home after school and just watch TV with Harabaji because it was easier than trying to do anything else. That by the time Amma and Appa came home from work and asked me if I did my homework, it was also easier to lie and say, yes, of course, because they already look so tired. I didn't want to add any more worry onto their shoulders that whatever I did, that whenever I did try to sit down to study, all I could see was their stressed faces, full of things they wouldn't tell me about. Don't worry, Amma would say, trying to protect me from their world where there wasn't enough money. Don't worry, I would say back, trying to protect them from my world where there wasn't enough focus. Back and forth, just like that, protecting each other from our worlds until we were living on two totally different planets. Oh my God. Damn, you're an actor. That's so good. <laughs> it's it's a great passage. I mean, the, the book is wonderful. And I love how you, in this book, you have this protagonist who lives in both worlds, uses Korean phrases, but is really like an American kid. And I love the, the use of Guk Chong Hachima because I, I know how you say that to your parents, they say that to you, and that you do end up kind of in your own worlds, protecting right. each other, but isolating yourselves. I wonder, is that um, a phrase that your parents used a lot in the house? Is that something from your own experience? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I was very curious, especially at that age, um, what my parents were thinking, what they were doing. Um, and I wanted to know more and they wanted to keep that separate. I think, you know, um, part of the immigrant experience is also I'm wiping history that slate clean for you. We're going to start fresh and you're not going to have the heaviness 
um, that I inherited. And I'm going to spare you that. But the more they hide it, the more they say, don't worry, the more invested, the more curious, the more worried you become, ironically. And I think um, it goes both ways. The You know, um, as a teenager, and Jordan is 12 on the cusp of, you know, that, that weird time, um, the more individuating you start to do, the more you say, please don't bother me, don't, you know, come in. But ironically, it's also the time when you really need it the most, when you need guidance when you need affirmations of love um, and connection. So it's a little family tragedy that so many, um, so many families have to deal with. And I think it's exacerbated given, um, you know, the conditions of immigrant life. So you have said uh, that you were uh, a bit of a class clown when you were younger. Were you like Jordan and a bit of a tr- troublemaker? I mean, you're a minister's son, and pr- there was probably a lot of pressure to be a little perfect. I wondered, was Jordan modeled on you as a 12 year old at all? Um, A little bit. Yeah. I mean, I tried to take a lot from myself and um, my friends. So it was definitely a blend of me and my friends. And what I knew that I wanted to start with a very imperfect kid. I mean, it was kind of a, a knee jerk reaction to the model minority myth. And maybe you'll like you know, you'll understand this, but we always hated, you know, the fictional mythical Peter Kim who lived in Cerritos, who got a 1600 on his SAT that was on the, that was in the Korea times that my parents would show us to say, (laughs) why can't you be more like Peter Kim from Cerritos? Oh, that's so funny. For me, it was Grace Park, who was the first Korean American valedictorian at Stuyvesant. (laughs) God, my mom made me get tutored by her friend's daughter, who was only a year older than me, and it was so humiliating. Oh, that's hilarious! <laughs> it was all it was embarrassing. Well, so that I knew that I wanted to start, um, that I didn't want my character to be that guy, you know. So um, it was anti Peter Kim. <laughs> so I knew we were starting there, and uh, I knew that that was a lot more relatable to me. And really, I was mm-hmm. writing a book for. Um, younger me, um, even more so than I was writing a book for my kids, you know what I mean? So this was an homage to, um, although it wasn't necessarily modeled after me, it was definitely for me at that age. Well, John, in in reading about your life and learning that your dad was a minister, a moksanim, right? Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, you know, that sounds like a lot of pressure because everybody knows who you are. You can never skip church on a Sunday. And the whole community knows, like, you're the son of the minister. What was that like? From what I understand, his church is, it was Church of Christ, right? Which is a a bit more strict in certain ways. Yeah. Um, What was that like? It was, um, I mean, it was a a mix of a lot of things. And I think it was, I, I think it was a really highly concentrated version of um, Korean culture, um, loving, surrounded by people, also a lot of um, fences, you know. Um, and, you know, yes, I did feel more pressure, I would say. But I feel like, you know, when you're living in a Korean community, the, the commu- your community shrinks because you're making your community tighter. And so sort of the eyes are the gaze, the gazes are a little more intense, but a lot of positives as well. You know, I, uh, so it was a a, a very intense version of all the good and the bad, I would say. But what what you do feel, and I think a lot of Korean kids feel is um, the rules are defined and the rules are enforced through shame. And you really, you were going to church every Sunday and you did Sunday school and... Sure, yeah. Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. The old ladies, uh, you know, get up for sunrise prayer sessions, um, so... That's my mom. Yeah. No sweat for the kids. It was easy for the kids. If we could bring it back to um, Troublemaker and some of the characters in that book, I really like that your book addresses maybe what could be the the seeds of... Mm -hmm miscommunication, confusion that could lead to something um, just a a lot more 
tragic later on, yeah. but that, that he's able to resolve it by making an effort and reaching out. I guess I have seen a lot of examples. I mean, I wasn't particularly thinking about extrapolating to where Jordan might go. I will also confess that this book was so impulsive and written quickly. And um, the idea came like a thunderbolt. I just went with my instincts on a lot of that stuff. And to that end, you know, even my father, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't think it was a lot like my relationship with my dad. And my dad recently read it and said, oh, wow, it's made me think a lot about how I raised you and all this stuff. And I said, uh, you have to explain what you mean. And he said, I'm not ready to talk to you about that yet. And uh, Oh, so interesting. Yeah. So uh, like, it's, 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 it's been a surprise to me, you know, what I've put in and why I did it. Like, I'm just sort of figuring mm-hmm. it out. But, but yeah, this, the reluctance to talk is something that's been in my family, you know, and in, in a lot of families. And I've known, you know, Asian American male friends of mine, you know, in our 20s, I feel like we walked around with clenched fists in our pockets, you know, sort of ready to ready to go because we, you know, the way we're dismissed by society, I think we harbor a lot of a lot of anger. And I, I've, I've been with a couple of friends of mine, Asian American men, and they're happy go lucky until somebody pushes them across the line and then it's all hell breaks loose. And I think that is from kind of keeping it bottled up. You know, th- this is a love story between two men who aren't talking to one another. Mm-hmm. Two, two, mm-hmm. And uh, at the end of the book, they connect and literally <laughs> finally speak to one another. Yeah. And um, so hopefully that's a good thing that people pick up on. So it all takes place on the day of the L.A. riots, right? Yeah, the first the first day of the L.A. riots. First day of the L.A. riots. Um The main character is Jordan, whose father owns a liquor store in Koreatown. Jordan and his father have had a huge fight. The reader doesn't know what they fought about, but Jordan is hiding some bad grades. He's he's feeling very hurt. His father goes off to board up the store, and Jordan wants to help his father by bringing him a gun. How did you decide to write this book? Well, I, I was going to write a different book altogether. I had a deal to write something different um, and it was going to be a lighter book, but, um, you know, 2020 came and there were a lot of things happening that were making me reevaluate everything. You know, we were the pandemic, the anti-Asian violence, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests. And obviously because of the pandemic, um, the kids were home and watching the news with us. And there was a lot of confusion. So I was in a place where I was thinking about these things from the vantage point of a kid because my kids were around. And especially the anti-Asian violence and and the murder of George Floyd made me sort of think about how I came to this country, what the country was in my head when we first got here, what I grew up thinking it was and where we were going. And it felt like, you know, um, I've said this before, but it felt like, the discussions I was having with my kids felt like something my my parents might have had with me, but I never imagined that I would be having with my kids. You know, there is a kind of assumption that each generation is going to have it better than the last. And I started thinking about another, um, you know, uh, another police brutality incident from my youth, you know, the Rodney King incident. And my thoughts went back there. And then I started imagining what it might have been like for a kid. So it was 1992, and back then you were at Berkeley, is that right? Yeah. What do you recall that day or that time in your life? I mean, the first thing I did was to call my parents and say, were were you trapped in Koreatown? Are you okay? And that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, do we know anyone? All that stuff. And and we didn't. And so that was an exhale. And then you started seeing the men on the roofs with with their guns. And um, then I thought, oh, my God, they're going to die. And they might kill people. And this is gonna, this is just gonna explode and become a massacre. I mean, that's what I was afraid of. And um, so that, I, I was just really panicked about that getting out of control. You, you know, we had seen the situation in South LA get out of control already so fast. And I thought this could get really bloody. So I was panicked about that. I didn't understand why they were up there. Um, now as you know, now that I'm older, I kind of see 
what the meaning of the, that building beneath them was, you know, that it was their life savings, may, maybe multi-generational savings, you know, and, yeah. and it was their future. It was college. It was the mortgage. It was food on the table. So it, they were fighting quite literally for their family's lives, you know, uh, up on the roof. And that, that was the stance they were taking. All, the, the other thing that I didn't really take into consideration at that age was that these weren't quote vigilantes necessarily, you know, because they were Korean immigrants, they were men who had gone through the military. And so they had a different relationship to guns, I think. You know, reading your book really made me think, okay, where was I when this happened? And it, I felt ashamed really, because I'm about your age. I was at college in New York and I remember seeing the news in my dorm and being shocked, horrified, but also kind of removed from it because we were in New York. It wasn't nearly as bad. And also I have to admit, because I felt like, well, we're not Koreans who own liquor store. Like, you know, my family is a different kind of family. And I couldn't identify exactly with what was going on. And I mostly thought about Rodney King, you know, and that injustice on campus. That's what everybody was worked up about. And, um, I wasn't involved in Asian groups or anything at Columbia. So I feel like I missed something really important. You know, this was a momentous watershed moment in Korean American history. Yeah. And I admit, I, I I don't think I I was there for it. I think too, um, and I, I won't, I'm not necessarily speaking for you, but I'll speak for me. But um, I think for a lot of us uh, of that age range, I would gather, and I'm sure there was part of that was in me, uh, of having internalized the model minority myth going, that's not the way we're supposed to be. You know, we're, we're not behaving the way right. we're supposed to, we're supposed to be at this age. I see that, see it as um, ill-advised, but really courageous as well, you know, but I didn't see it that way. Then I was mm -hmm. like, we listen, listen to what they're telling us, go inside, you know, um, get safe. Don't make trouble, more trouble. Don't make trouble, you know, right. don't be a troublemaker. This is uh, such an interesting conversation because even with the three of us here, my parents owned a beauty supply store in downtown Newark. So they were definitely, you know, you know, across the country, but of the demographic that would have been, you know, ransacked basically. And, you know, my parents have had altercations with um, shoplifters and uh, they've been broken into numerous times. They've had their lives threatened. They've been held up. My impression when I was in college in, you know, Rhode Island was I was just so anguished and upset that the the cops weren't coming, that law and order, you know, had broken down and that the Koreans had to fend for themselves, but they were being portrayed and forced into a corner and uh, shown in such a, a non-flattering light. Well, I, I kind of see the whole situation as um, as having been defined by um, police action or lack of police action. Mm -hmm. One was, of course, the brutality against Rodney King. I'm sure the reason that Koreans um, owned guns in the first place down there was they couldn't count on police to come when they called. Absolutely. The, there's a history of police injustice against African-Americans. Then the day that happens, well, first they move the trial up to Simi Valley to get an all white jury. Then they announce the verdict, they're set free. Then the police abandon um, South Central and Koreatown altogether. And you saw the footage of the hundreds of police cars surrounding the federal building in Westwood. So it was, you know, I don't know how to put this politely. It was an abdication of duty um, on sort of all around. And there was all this anger. There's this tremendous tornado of fury and we were caught up in it, you know? And I think a lot of Koreans felt like, I don't get it. Obviously there were, the relations weren't great between the two communities and yet I think Koreans um, largely felt like, I don't get it, that the cops were white, the jury was white, um, and the, the victim was black, and yet, you know, our stores are being targeted. So it was very complicated, mm -hmm. but the conditions were set up um, by police, I think, in every, in every way. 
So what sort of research did you do for the book? Did you interview people who lived through it? You know, we didn't do a whole lot of uh, research. You know, we were trying to make sure our timeline was right. I more interviewed uh, <laughs> friends and family to sort of yeah. get flavors, but um, the 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 most critical person that we talked to was Richard Choi, who was um, a broadcaster at Radio Korea, and Radio Korea kind of became a character in the novel, and um, and he gave us really this insight that became. I don't know, kind of the spine of the book. He said, well, I think the biggest thing for us is that prior to that event, I think in my opinion, Koreans, we still thought of ourselves as sojourners that we, you know, we were not committed to to being here in, in deep down. We thought, well, maybe we'll return to Korea someday. I don't know, you know, that they were keeping things open. And after that day, he, he said, we really did become Korean Americans. Um, he saw in, you know, uh, the rise of Korean American politicians. Uh, it just felt like roots were really planted that day. That sort of thing happens often after trauma. Our blood was spilt, and and um, and I th and I think there was a sort of mental shift, a group collective shift in how in the relationship to the country in which they were living. It seems like when you were in college, um, this sort of when you had this well. It was college when the events happened, the LA riots, but also when you started acting in the beginning was very much in the Asian American space of the East West Theater Company. Is that right? Yeah. Before you went to college though, what was your involvement in Asian American things or in Korean? Like, how did you navigate that world? I think when I came to college, I was open to that sort of thing. Um, well, I mean, I think in college, I was trying out this new identity, which was being Asian American, which is a completely brand new thought to me. Before it was, you know, we, we when we said Americans in our house, my parents meant white people. Yeah. So there were Americans and us, Koreans. And I think when I went to college, I was experimenting with this new identity, which was an Asian American. Uh, it was a do new t-shirt to wear, you know? And so I was trying that out. And it's how I identified myself for years, I think. And then, and now I, 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 I it's all over the place, but I would you know, I'm, I'm closer to where I was when I was a kid, you know, I think if I'm asked now, what are you, I would say I'm Korean, you know, and leave it at that. For sure. I was, I was, I was sort of trying it all out. You were an English major in college. If you hadn't fallen into acting, what do you think that you would have pursued? I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was sort of like, well, what keeps me reading books? I, maybe I'll just go to more school. <laughs> and the, and then I thought maybe I'll uh, I'll just get another English degree and then after that maybe I'll teach English. You want to be a writer or maybe go to graduate school? Yes, I I, I was thinking that. I th thought maybe there's a career for me as a writer, but um, I was um, not putting a tremendous amount of pressure on myself to figure it out. I was letting myself float. I figured I was young. And even when I started acting, I, I fell into it in, in college. And then when I started acting, I was, I said, I just said, um, well, I'll give it a couple of years and see what happens. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm young and um, I've got some years to burn. And your parents didn't have a specific idea of what they wanted you to be. Did they, did they pressure you one way or the other law school or I don't know. No, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't pushy. I'm not sure why. Um, but, uh, you know, they were the, you know, when I said I was going to major in English, they were just concerned, how are you going to pay the rent? Uh, how are you going to eat? That sort of thing that those were their real concerns. And, you know, when I, when I, um, said I was going to major in English, my, my dad said, well, maybe you can write the history of Koreans in America someday, you know. He was always seeing, uh, how can I better the community? Somebody said to me, it's an exciting time to be Korean right now. I, I mean, you kind of blazed that acting path as a Korean uh, American alone, and now you've got a lot of lot more company. And I wondered if you could kind of comment on what you've seen that's changed um, 
within your career uh, as far as having a lot more Asian actors around? Yeah, it's awesome. I think when I was coming up, there was this idea of you were the one. And so being the one, it restricts your choices in, in a lot of ways because you have to do, you have to rebel against this or you have to go f into this, you have to paint this portrait or that, it, you know, it's, it's much healthier to do it collectively. And I think that the change um, is not gonna be driven by one person or one kind of breakthrough movie or breakthrough person it's much healthier that it's being done in, in a collective way and I, I love it mm -hmm. um the other thing that's really been nice is um i think the asians that were in this, in the in the industry when i started everyone was sort of in their towers and sort of felt alone yeah yeah in, in all these in all their positions and now people are much more apt to know one another to lean on one another that's a very sustainable model i'd say so things are really in a healthy place, I'd say, and there's a lot of talent and um, and um, the ethos is also different, you know, that people aren't looking to be the one. There, there aren't a, a ton of people looking to be the one, but sort of knowing that it's going to be together, I think that's also a, a sustainable model. Good morning, John. Thank you for joining us again to continue our conversation. Sorry about last time. Not at all. I, I'm the one who should apologize. So one of the reasons we wanted to interview you is I write a lot about children's books. So I was so intrigued to read in your author's note that you had originally been contracted to write a different middle grade book, A Mystery. Can you tell us what that book was and why even um, A Middle Grade Mystery? Well, um, we didn't get that far down the road, so I don't have a whole lot of details. It was really when we were um, pitching out ideas that I changed course. Um, but why middle grade? It was really, uh, that age is when books sort of meant the most to me. You know, those middle grade years are awkward years in general. Um, but in my life, that was compounded by us moving around quite a bit during that time. So um, I felt like I relied on books uh, more than most uh, during that age for a safe place and, um, you know, a, 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 an identity that was apart from school and, and uh, family. What books do you remember loving when you were that age? It was a little before this, but I remember before that age that I got introduced to these books, but I would say the most important books of my young life were um, the Little House on the Prairie series. Me too. Oh, really? I love them. And I still, to this day, um, I think about them all the time. When I'm cooking, I think, would Ma Ingalls do this? <laughs> or, oh, mm -hmm. those kids would have been happy with this toy. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I I, I also, um, I think there was a, uh, uh, a kinship there because um, we were immigrants and they were pioneers. So I... I I felt like I really uh, I connected with their story and the characters and and so um yeah I thought of my dad as pa and my mom as ma <laughs> <laughs> Were you Laura then? <laughs> I guess so. I guess I was Laura. Um Yeah. Spunky <clears throat> independent. Well, I suppose, that's so funny. I'm the older one. I suppose I should be Mary, but um, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't think of it was half bite. She's too virtuous. <laughs> what about? Um, I wasn't sure if maybe you had been like a Hardy Boys fan or something because you were doing a mystery. Why a mystery? No, I didn't read the Hardy Boys. I liked uh, the Three Investigators. I liked the Great Brain. Um, oh, I love the Great Brain. Juliana, did you ever read the Great Brain? No, I was Encyclopedia Brown, team Encyclopedia Brown. Yeah, the Great Brain was the best. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did. I, I guess I, and part of the spirit of the mystery novel, I think, is in Troublemaker in that, um, you know, what I loved about those, about the mystery novels uh, uh, back then is um, uh, kids solving adu problems adults couldn't. I thought that was just really a, a really gold idea. Um, and I quite enjoyed uh, kids going out um, into the world and uh, solving uh, a little thing that uh, adults were unequipped to do. And um, 
there is a, a bit of that, I think, uh, that independence in in um, Troublemaker, uh, you know, the Jordan trying to get across L.A. Uh, without a car, um, without permission in the uh, at night, that did feel uh, kind of akin to that 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 mystery plot. And they're solving things. Uh, it's it, you know they're solving little problems inside the novel. Did you at one point think? of maybe writing um, an adult book, a memoir? I'm actually not that keen on sharing details from my personal life. Um, so I, I, a memoir seems like a stretch, but I have a lot of thoughts on uh, various <laughs> topics that I that maybe it would be appropriate for a book one day. Um, but uh, yeah. Do you mean nonfiction then? More like... Um... Yeah, if it was a memoir, it might be, you know, if it was in the nonfiction category, I don't know. I'm, pr I'm probably talking prematurely. I, 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 it, could be, um, it could be in the works. I mean, I could be convinced into doing that someday. There was one um, interview that you gave on a podcast, Asian Enough, um, yeah. that I was particularly struck by the comments that you had made about Asian male anger. And mm. um, you said you were tempted to gift the Valentine to the Asian male community by making a film of you just killing people, just going on a murderous rampage because Asian men are really just ready to fight um, because we've been shit on all our lives. And I was so gratified to hear you say that. And I thought it was so brave of you to say that out loud and bring up that topic because um, even though I'm an Asian female, this is something that I've been thinking about for, you know, ever since I was in college. And I think everybody knows uh, of a young man who, um, you know, stopped going to college and then had to go live with relatives in Korea to teach English because this is the way that Korean Americans did mental health um, back then. You've really been sending these Valentines to Asian American men kind of all along, Um because you were the first Asian male to do, you know, blank in film and TV, whether it be like breaking stereotypes on accents or the Asian lead in a romantic series or the Asian guy who gets the white girl. And I know that the Asian men are keeping track out there and um, they must be cheering you on from the sidelines. And they, I know that they must reach out to you. And I wondered if that kind of helped you to overcome it. Uh, you know, to some extent, I feel like um, a, a lot of the anger that I had as a young man is, is dissipated over the years for, you know, naturally I, I married it. I, I have kids. So that's, you know, um, not as a significant uh, part of my life as it used to be, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I still see it out there. Um, but but there's so many questions in your question. I'm trying to figure out which one to answer. I know it's like chock full because <laughs> I've been dying <laughs> to have this conversation with somebody, which is why I was really excited that you had brought it up in that um, But it's podcast. definitely something I see all over the place with so many friends of mine. Um, and it, you know, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of digging be if you're honest before you, um, before you find it. And um, even I walk around with it, uh, I think. And sometimes I feel like my life is, uh, I can have little respites of, you know, freedom from my race because uh, I'm an actor, um, because I'm known and I'm treated a different way. Uh, but uh, an anonymous Asian um, American man has to walk around with that by the way, that's an illusion for me, you know, like at the end of the day, they, they always see it, but, you know, I can kind of have temporary, uh, you know, fame can be a temporary bomb, you know, but. You, you can be John Cho first and Asian yes, second yeah. in somebody else's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but it's always there and I know it, you know, um, that's the way it is in America. People see that first, um, but. Yeah, I have great sympathy. Uh, I guess I'm just, uh, I'll just amen your point instead of answering a question. But yes, I have great sympathy because I've seen it so much and they're my friends. So when you had a son, did you have any 
uh, anxiety about how he would grow up and wonder if he would have the same kinds of burdens and did you try to shield him from any of that? For whatever reason, I wasn't that worried. Uh, maybe it was a generational hope, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I just spent most of my time being delighted, you know? I had a, a boy first and then a daughter second and I immediately by default did some of my dad's, you know, tough boy practices on him, you know, which I was quickly... Uh, advised Excellent. against by my wife uh, i'm all i'm not all that worried he doesn't seem to have that um so far well back to what you mentioned before um we talked about judy bloom book where the punishment was go to your room and i thought that was the easiest most lame punishment because we were spanked you know you have to do that thing where you hit your hands are in the air did you do those kind of typical <laughs> Korean punish, were you punished in that classic Korean punishment style? Well, I was beaten. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's a classic. That's a worldwide classic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what were you beaten with? I was beaten with a wooden spoon, personally. And for many years, I was afraid to look at the spoon because every time I saw my mom reach for the spoon, to, even to cook, I would think about being hit with the spoon. <laughs> what I do wrong? Um, I think it was hands mostly, and um, I, you know, uh, Lincoln logs, whatever was around. Um, but I'm trying to remember if the belt was there. I can't remember that. Um, but it wasn't that bad. But we got, we got. I got a good beating after that. Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing quip. Mm. I'll say that much. Um, but. Uh, it tailed off. I have told this other story, as one does, uh, with some Korean friends. Uh, we, we were comparing uh, beating stories. And uh, <laughs> I had a friend who um, who once was told by his mother, uh, he, he and his sister were told by his mother, uh, by their mother, uh, that's it. I'm sending you back to Korea. And she got the suitcases down from the closet, to get inside, and she zipped them up. <laughs> <laughs> in the suitcase? Yeah, they were just, you know, wailing inside uh, the suitcases. <laughs> oh, my God, what trauma. <laughs> That's a new one. I mean, I'm sorry for laughing. What, when I bring up beating children, I'm laughing. I know it, sound, it seems horrendous to people, but honestly, I was stunned as a kid that other kids, that that wasn't a normal thing, that you got spanked. Yeah, yeah, it was very normal. <laughs> When we have a guest who's brave enough to talk about, you know, being beat up as a kid, um, there's a part of me that thinks, oh my God, thank goodness that we're, you're bringing this up because we've all been through it. And uh, there's another part of me that wonders, how do we further this conversation, <laughs> you know? And uh, um, uh, I think laughter and just kind of acknowledging it is one way of dealing with it. But um, I just think it's really important that we put it out there and just even start talking about it. There's a lot to be celebrated and a lot to, I guess you could say, unpack. Um, I hate that word, but um, I, I think because Koreans are being celebrated and having achieved so much in recent years, I think um, people don't want to ruin that celebratory um, mood by actually discussing some of the, um, the hardships about um, growing up and the fullness of what it means, um, you know, in our culture. So, yeah, I, I it just, uh, I didn't, I didn't know people were hiding it. It seemed like it was pretty out in the open. John, I have learned that you narrated the, a PBS special on the Korean war, which I didn't realize you had done. And I started watching it. I thought it was terrific. Tell me a little bit about what you learned or what that experience was like working on that special? I'm very interested in the Korean War in general because it's such one, because it's such a, obviously, the defining event of my my parents' lives uh, and therefore a defining event in mine. Um, so I'm always curious about what happened. Um, it's a very confusing event. It's everything about it is so blurry. Even if you read the most... Uh, you know, concise textbook, it's, to me, it doesn't really explicate what happened. And uh, I'm trying, I'm struggling to recall anything specific I learned from that documentary, but I, uh, but I'm always fascinated. Um, and I guess it's also uh, combined with the reticence of my parents' generation to really get into it, um, except in mm -hmm. sort of broad, 
broad general statements, but um, yeah. What are some things that as a kid you knew about the Korean War from your parents? Like, what was your understanding of their experience? Like, my father's very conservative, so there was a real kind of, um, I think what, you know, the story I got that I'm trying to understand better was a real black and white political experience between right and left. You know, there was this great war between democracy and communism. So I think he's, he sort of sees it in a classic Western political lens, you know? Uh, and that's a lot of immigrants I've found, you know, um, both- uh, Yeah, there are a lot of- Cuban- Our dads, Cuban. our generation's dads are Republican yeah. or secretly Republican or voting conservatively. Yes, yes. I mean, I and I was saying that's seems to be the case with Cubans and Vietnamese as well, you know, in America. So it's a self-selecting group, maybe the ones that immigrate. I don't know. That's was sort of the it was a great, you know, this great battle, this great political battle. Beyond the Korean War, I think the military dictatorship um, and the 70s and 80s are a really interesting time. Um, and it, yeah, I think even just watching some of the K dramas, like uh, when the is it the IMF uh, when uh, the um, the Korean um, economy tanked, and just how many people ended up um, it destroying their lives. Um, there's this K drama I'm watching right now where this wealthy family have to go into hiding. There are just pieces of history that are coming, you know through that I just never even knew existed. Yeah, same. Um, I'm getting some of that in fiction. I mean, I was reading, uh, I read a, a novel uh, called um, Offerings set uh, uh, against the backdrop of the IMF collapse. In, in it, it goes back uh, to the 70s and 80s, flashbacks to these student demonstrations. And I actually learned, mm. I learned a lot about, you know, some basic stuff about contemporary Korean history that I had no idea. Um, Absolutely the Korea that they left, essentially, uh, I, yeah. I, I know less about than the Korea that they were born into. Well, when um, people talk about immigrants and how their um, their politics and their uh, identity is sort of arrested development from the time that they left the country of origin, yeah. it's not surprising that our immigrant story and our parents are who they are because maybe their identity and their opinions um, were formed and they stopped developing from the 70s in Korea politically. Um, I always say that the, the version of Korean culture that the immigrants brought over, you know, like they pickled it and it is now, that version of Korean culture is, and cuisine and all of it is now American because it doesn't exist as such in Korea anymore. Absolutely. So yeah. we've absorbed mm -hmm. that, that's just American now. I go to Seoul and at one time, I'm sure LA's Koreatown really looked like Seoul, but now they don't resemble each other very much anymore. And um, uh, like, I, I was just out at a, I just ate at a restaurant, I'm in New York uh, right now. And I ate at a restaurant the other night, a Korean restaurant, and they were using different ingredients here. I had like this burrata, pear, kimchi, heirloom tomato dish that was very fascinating and I, I, I was thinking well this is this is a, a meal that uh, I wouldn't have in Koreatown but I, but it could be something I would have in Seoul based on mm -hmm. my last yeah. trip there mm -hmm. so it was very very interesting to me by the way I should give a shout out to the restaurant 8282 on the Lower East Side but uh, I think it's very interesting because when I was growing up Korean TV was a very low quality that that's how we thought mm -hmm. about, it, you know, as compared to American television shows. I look back now, I was just recently watching uh, the original Knight Rider on, um, on Netflix, because <laughs> it was a show I liked when I was a kid. And, and I was like, wow, that that shows. Uh, uh, it's not great. Uh, so I don't know why. I... <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, it felt like uh, they were lagging behind or that industry the industry in korea was lagging behind and now you know it feels like what they're doing in entertainment is actually spilling over and helping asian american actors you know instead of absolutely the other way around. um so it's been a fascinating turn of uh, events so your korean was really quite good in columbus do you have have you had offers or 
um, been approached um, to work in Korea? And- Only like a couple of times, really. Um, I haven't really been, been uh, that hasn't really come across my desk as very often. Is that something you're interested in and maybe, you know, pursuing on your end? I might be, yeah. Um, I've always been afraid to act in Korean, except in little bursts, because y- uh, I think you have to have a, a real a real grasp of the language you're acting in in order to do a good job. You have to sink into it's, you know, really deep, as in my opinion. I'm a person that works from the words in. Um, Sometimes mm-hmm. uh, people work from the intent and out to the words, but I, I think I start with the words and go and, and sink into them. So the way I work, I think it would be difficult to work in a language that I'm not, that I don't feel super proficient in. But on the other hand, I'm interested in, you know, who changed my mind on that? It's probably Stephen Yun um, and watching him act in Korean. I go, wow, he was, uh, that was, that that worked. You know, he's he's pulling mm-hmm. it off. And and I thought, well, maybe th- that's very fascinating. Maybe I, I'll give it a shot one of these days. And I also like the idea of, you know, I guess I've uh, I've been known as an actor who's, you know, the Asian guy who seems American, whatever that means, that that's an incredibly flawed phrase. But, you know, I'm using it to illustrate a point, you know, and I like the idea of me speaking Korean on screen one day, you know, Mm -hmm. doing it well. And obviously, I have people who speak Korean in my life who, who I love. So I would like to do that as a gesture also, if I could dutifully do that, you know, if I could execute it well. But what's the point if there, there are a lot of good Korean actors? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the point is for them, you know, for, for the filmmaker. You posted a picture of yourself at the Oscars with a Parasite cast, and you said that everybody was congratulating you for your performance in Parasite. <laughs> <laughs> just in a picture with them and like, oh, he must have been in that movie. <laughs> Good job. I got a lot of pats on the back. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats for being Asian. <laughs> Maybe that was it. Thank you to John Cho for joining us on K-Pod, a production of Korean American Story. John's book, Troublemaker, is available now. Our audio engineer is AJ Valente. Our executive producer is HJ Lee. You can follow us on Instagram at Korean American Story. You can follow Juliana at Juliana underscore Son. And you can follow me at Catherine Hong 100. Thanks for listening and take care.